We are related to welcome you to Inspiring Voices from the Classroom. Inspiring Voices is a one-of-a-kind show designed to recognize and highlight current mathematics classroom teachers and provide a positive platform that allows their authentic voices to be heard. Abi Ruiz has seven years of teaching experience and is currently a fourth grade mathematics and science teacher at Dover Shores Elementary. Abi earned a master's degree in K-8 mathematics and science education from the University of Central Florida and is now a Noyce Fellow at UCF, specializing in K-8 mathematics instruction. Abi believes that all students bring forth a wealth of knowledge and that they are capable mathematicians. She enjoys collaborating with educators who are interested in designing innovative curriculum that invites learners to see the wonders, joys, and beauty of mathematics. Welcome to Inspiring Voices from the Classroom. I'm your host, Dr. Christopher J. Childs. Inspiring Voices from the Classroom is designed to highlight amazing mathematics educators. On this episode, we have Abby Ruiz. Abby, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you for having me. What is exciting happening in the world of an educator nowadays? Um, recently, we were at the teacher table and I was tweeting about that. I know you saw it. We were playing a fraction game and I love teaching fractions. Um, and we were just having a great time and then we're exploring different sizes and the student goes to everybody and picks up a 16th and goes, when the teacher gives you a pizza at the pizza party. And she just, boom roasted everybody started laughing so much and that just brought me so much joy because the kids are not only mathematizing everything but they're also comfortable to play and engage and have joy in a space with mathematics and me so that brought me a lot of joy recently oh that's so amazing so are you telling the audience and you're telling me math can be fun it can definitely be fun and it could be really fun to teach as well so tell us ways that math can be fun and engaging i know our audience is going to look oh just fun and games but how can it be rewarding also so i think that in order to make mathematics fun you have to start with who you're teaching so you have to get to know your students authentically um, to figure out what would be engaging for them and what they would enjoy and i think that a lot of people confuse relevant and culturally relevant teaching to slapping somebody's name on a word problem. So I could say Dr. Child has a thousand, I don't know, oranges and Abby has five. Well, what do we know about that? Have you ever had a thousand oranges in front of you? What does that look like? So I think just getting beyond that and actually engaging with the students and getting to know their lives at home because believe it or not, these are children outside of the confines of our classroom. So I think it starts there. It really is organic and ever evolving. So um, I think that has helped a lot with my teaching and making it fun because it's something that they're interested in and it's something that I'm interested in as well to get to know the students that are in the classroom. Let's pause for a moment and restate that math is more than just slapping a child's <laughs> name in the verb problem and saying, oh my gosh, we use Abby's name in the problem and the context has nothing to do with the child. Exactly. Oftentimes, a lot of folks try to make that I'm doing cultural responsive teaching because I put a name in the word problem. And I push back on that and say, are you putting the child's story, their cultural experiences, who they are into the word problem, or literally just a name? Putting a name in a word problem is not cultural responsive teaching. Right. And I know in your classroom, you do a lot of things with ch children's identity, mm -hmm. which ties into, we're gonna get into cultural responsive teaching. Can you tell the audience more about math identity and what does that mean in the classroom? Sure, so a math identity is um, what the child believes that they are capable of or what roles that they fit into. So at the beginning of the year, I always do this activity because I teach departmentalized mathematics and science. I ask them to draw what a mathematician looks like and what a scientist looks like. And I, first of all, don't wanna come in there assuming that all kids think that they're going to be mad at mathematics because that's not always the case. Some kids come in very, very confident as they should be. Um, but more often than not, we have kids drawing things that do not or people that don't look like them. So I have an example here for you. Um, I asked this student, can you explain more to me about your work? And on the left side, she told me a mathematician is named Bob and Bob looks very scary and Bob looks um, very mean. And in the thought bubble, he is screaming, do your work. And then I asked for her to describe to me the scientist and it's a drawing of an alien. Um, 
and it's supposedly holding a beaker. So then what that tells me is that first of all, mathematics is something that they are not comfortable in. Mathematics is a scary subject and the people who do mathematics are angry and they're men. And secondly, what that tells me about their perception of scientists is that it's literally out of this world, inaccessible. So I take what they tell me and build off of that to make sure that first of all, I'm not assuming and making assumptions of what they believe that they can do. But secondly, so that I get a good gauge of where my students are at and what I need to do to create an environment where they do see themselves as mathematicians and scientists who are not angry or aliens. <laughs> I, I love this image that you just showcased because a lot of times it also comes down to who have children seeing representative of mathematics, mathematicians and scientists. Most of our children, let me let me rephrase it because I know some people are going to get politically correct with me. Most of the children in the United States school system identify as melanated. They identify as Hispanic, Latino, Latina, they identify as black, they identify as Asian, they identify as Pacific Islander, they identify as two or more races. So when I say melanated, I don't say people of color because if you say people of color, you're saying by default people are white. Just putting that out there. But coming back to this, so when I say most children haven't seen themselves, I'm talking about the majority of children in the United States school system do not see themselves depicted as a mathematician or a scientist. So when it's time for them to draw the image or make an identity reference, they oftentimes identify or look at someone else who is not looking like them. Mm -hmm. And I'm putting the onus on you as educators, what images are you putting in front of children? What experiences are you putting in front of children? Publishers, what are you depicting in the book? And going beyond images, what stories and narratives are placed within that piece? So taking it back into your classroom, and I've seen your classroom, it is amazing by the <laughs> way. How does this math identity connect to the mathematics content that's been, that is happening in your classroom? Right, so what I do is first of all get to know my students authentically and I also disclose things about me because I can't ask for students to be in a vulnerable position without me doing so as right. well. So first we create norms and I make sure that I communicate that I have high ex expectations of all students. Um, next when I'm looking at tasks, I think about um, the task within the context of my own classroom. Oftentimes districts come up with lesson plans or suggestions and this is a one size fits all. But as we know, classrooms are organic. Every year, it's a new situation, every day. You don't know what the students are bringing in or um, how their experiences that day are, go are going to ex um, affect the way that they interact in the classroom. So for example, we had a unit on place value and I wanted to make sure the students had um, concrete tools to make sense of place value. So I, you know, during morning meetings, we talk a lot about food because we all love food. And one time, one of my students shared an experience where she was counting beans and she called, vamos a limpiar frijoles. So I've experienced that. So what happens is when people are making beans, they sit down and they go through each bean to make sure they take out the ones that are not going to be good. And that's, you know, you wash them and, and you um, cook them. So that's an experience that I thought of. And I went to the store and I got thousands of beans, literally thousands and thousands of beans. And I had students estimate how many beans were going to be in their group. I had them count them. I had them place them in cups and they made sense of how to do that. So that not only goes into teaching standards-based instruction, but it is also based on something that the students are able to relate back to. And I think oftentimes when people re uh, refer to creating tasks that are windows and mirrors, they think, well, if I create a mirror for one student, another student is going to suffer. And that's not true. Because while these students who had never seen this bean task ever saw a mirror, the other students who had no idea what it meant to clean beans right. saw a window. So these students now are experiencing somebody else's culture and the experts of that is not a YouTube video showing how to wash beans, it's not a picture. It's the children who are saying, this is what I did the other day and sharing their experiences with their families. So thinking about tasks and going back to uh, basing everything on what students can engage with, it just benefits all students. Um, and not just some. I love how you bring in the windows and mirrors piece, but I also like how you're also incorporating the sliding glass doors. Sounds like you're referencing the Rook of Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, and the sliding glass doors allows you not only to see it, but it allows you to experience it. And what we need to think through, especially in this country, we're based in Florida, both of us, 
a lot of things happening in Florida. Depending upon when you're watching this episode, probably things still happening in Florida. <laughs> but it's getting folks to understand how do you learn about other cultures, what they bring to the table, and how do we better encompass everyone in these inclusive environments as opposed to continue to build up walls and barriers for others to be a part of that educational experience. When I was in your classroom visiting, you were doing an amazing number counting activity with place value. Mm -hmm. Could you describe that activity a little bit? And we're gonna roll a little bit of footage of your classroom also. Great. So that was one of the times that I was looking ahead at the scope and sequence and pacing. And um, this is what was expected of students, which was just to fill out a table where students would decompose um, 2,340. So I thought, okay, I know my students, I know that they learn best when they're engaging in partner talk and when they have manipulatives. So I actually adapted the task. Now in the video, you'll see them counting a, a number low in, in, lower in value, and that's not because I didn't think that they could decompose this number. It's just because I didn't have the manipulatives enough to, for all groups. So you'll see them engaging in conversations conversation. You'll see them challenging each other. You'll see students become super passionate about defending their answers and that's again because they feel safe enough to do so and they know that even if they do make a mistake, that mistake is respected, valued, and it's up for examination by everybody. So I love that video because first of all the students are the ones doing the talking. I'm taking more of a role of a facilitator rather than a moderator because I understand that the students are coming in and they are knowledgeable and if they are given the time and space to process things they can get there I don't have to do the thinking for them I love how you speak in this asset-based mindset of the students in your classroom and your environment what I would love for you to do you have an amazing relationship also with families mm -hmm. that are uh, a part of your classroom environment not just the students in it but their families are part of it what advice would you give to an early career teacher as it relates to engaging families in this process and this culture building and this community um, that you, mirac I want to say miraculous, that you eloquently develop in your environment. <laughs> Sure, I love that you asked me that because that's part of the reasons why I became an educator. Um, I remember growing up in a farm worker community and as my dad was in the fields, um, you know, planting sugar cane, my mom and my sister and I would wake up at five in the morning and we would make uh, food for the farm workers in the community and sell to make ends meet. So me and my sister would get up and make thousands of tortillas and we used to package them in fives. So all morning we were sitting there placing bets which were estimates of who can make the most tortillas how many plates would we sell and how much money we would make. So I was doing math all morning. Then I was going to school and because I didn't know the language yet, I was failing every single math test. So even though I had experience, I had rich experience with mathematics and my family would be able to contribute to my understanding of what I was learning in school, there was a blockade there. So I'm very intentional about including families and making sure that they understand that they belong in the classroom. So often my parents didn't go to those conferences or to those school events, not because they weren't invested in me, but because they felt intimidated in a space that they didn't feel they belonged in. So I make it a point to be intentional and reach out to families because at the end of the day, they are that child's first teacher. I will never know that child better than a parent does. So I'm tapping into their funds of knowledge so that we could work collaboratively to help these students succeed. And thinking about students this evening, if you had a magic wand, what would you like to see happen in education? I would like for educators to look at the whole child. I think a lot of the times we see a roster at the beginning of the year and we see a lot of labels. And if we're not careful or intentional, we let those labels guide us in making assumptions that then shift our whole classroom environment to, you know, carry out expectations low and high about certain students. I was a student that had a lot of labels and by a lot of people's uh, standards, there, there would be no reason for me to one, be a mathematics educator, two, and be a doctoral student. So if I had a magic wand, I would make sure that everybody invested time in getting to know those kids and tapping into the knowledge that they bring to help create more culturally responsive education that in turn is going to benefit the whole classroom. Abby, thank you for being on Inspiring Voices from the Classroom. It's been amazing 
uh, giving you the opportunity just to share the amazing things I see in your classroom environment with our audience. And I want to challenge our viewers out there. A lot of things were discussed in this episode. I want to challenge you, every educator, to think about what are you doing to make sure every child under your purview is seen and valued in your educational environment. Every family, when they drop off their child to your environment, is giving you their best. Are we creating an environment that is going to cultivate that and provide them, and us as educators, provide that family, provide that child our best? Oftentimes, many children, when they enter a building or enter their environment, they leave who they are at the door in order to just survive. Educational environments should not be about survival, but it should be about a liberation experience. What are we providing for that to occur? What are you doing for that to occur? Are you getting to know the children in your environment? Are you getting to know the families in your environment? And are you creating something for them or are you creating something for you? Let me say that again. Are you creating something for them or are you creating something for you? We can do better as collective educators in this space and it starts with each of us, not the next person, not the supervisor, not the superintendent. It starts with you and your environment. Cultivate an environment that children want to be in, families want to be a part of, and ultimately, as Malcolm X stated, education is the passport to the future. Let's provide folks this passport. This has been your boy, Dr. Christopher J. Childs. I'll see you on the next episode. Do you want to be a guest on the show? Fill out the online submission form at www.christopherchilds.com shows.